Well, the numbers of TB, not only pulmonary, but bones, joints, and meningitis were huge during the Second World War years and in the 50s. Uh, and uh, my father, Dr. Benjamin Chu, who was senior physician with Dr. Clarence Smith here mm -hmm. in this hospital, and with Dr. Srinivasan, who was battling the disease at KK, uh, soon after the war, uh, at, at the has requested Rotary Club to donate a building. And they did. And this was the Rotary Clinic. You'll see the foundation stone, I think, behind me uh, in the late 40s. Yes, uh, also at that behest, they requested the foundation of a voluntary organization to combat tuberculosis. And this was SATA, also founded at about the same time. They, with uh, 12 other members, were the founders of SATA. And these were the two centers that battled tuberculosis during the early post war years. Well, uh, the Rotary Clinic uh, at TTS was the main center. And of course, uh, the battle against tuberculosis continues at our tuberculosis uh, control unit in this hospital. SATA battled the disease for a number of years, but it has now become more of a health community center. Well, those days, there were no resources. We had no drugs, uh, and uh, the treatment of tuberculosis depended much on bed rest, nursing, good nursing, and collapse therapy. Of course, these are all now obsolete. Streptomycin came to us just after the war, in 1946 or 1947, with INH in 1951. They were the two most potent drugs that uh, we had, and uh, we started using those regimes. It was a very long regime, two years of treatment with streptomycin, PS, and isoniazide. Right? We had very good results based on the studies of our good friends, Professor Sir John Crofton in Edinburgh. Uh, they found almost 100% cure if treatment was regular, patients were compliant, and, uh, and we modeled our treatment based on Professor John Crofton's uh, regime of uh, streptomycin, PS, isoniazide, and for a few months, and then followed by PS and isoniazide right, daily for a total of two years. So that was a very long regime. But that uh, brought down the incidence of tuberculosis to very low levels in those days. Uh, the other strategy we had was BCG vaccination. Mm -hmm. That was, we insisted that BCG be given uh, mandatory to all newborns. And uh, we had very good coverage, almost 100%, because most of the births were at KK Hospital. So our nurses, very early uh, uh, after birth, gave the vaccination. And this was, of course, boosted in later years in school. Uh, well, uh, the numbers of bones and joints, TB, and uh, biliary and biliary and meningitis, of course, break down drastically. And today, I don't think we see bones and joints, TB, and uh, uh, biliary and meningitis uh, hardly any today. So that was our strategy at that time. Uh, we depended lots on uh, follow-up because uh, treatment was long. We had to ensure that the patients were compliant. And so we had very good results. We did treatment surveys 
uh, we were of course a third world country at that time. WHO was quite helpful. They even sent a specialist to us uh, in the 60s. And that was when we formed the tuberculosis uh, research uh, committee. Well, soon after that, we had uh, a letter, I think it was through WHO, from Dr. Wallace Fox. He was the head of uh, British MRC tuberculosis unit and requesting us to collaborate with him in studies. Well, we had several studies and uh, from two-year long-term regimen and later on that paved the way for short course regimens when uh, rifampicin uh, was uh, discovered. That was the, then when started, the study started in about 1975 onwards. Uh, well, the long duration of treatment is not easy for patients to comply. Uh, but nevertheless, our nurses and our contact uh, staff did very well. They were based mainly in Rotary Clinic, in fact. And the studies we had was also based at Rotary Clinic. So that was, uh, uh, these were the important milestones. The formation of tuberculosis registry also very important. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's also when the Department of Tuberculosis Control evolved uh, at Bowman Road. The two houses are still there. They're still being used mm -hmm. now for the control of TB. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, how the incidence of TB gradually came down. Yes. Well, uh, when we did studies with the British Medical Research Council, that not only uh, concerned chemotherapy, we also did studies on compliance. Mm. And we found that with good chemotherapy, even with the standard regimens of two years, as long as the patients comply, mm. we, do, we did not require long-term hospitalization. Mm. In fact, one week at the most was more than sufficient as long as patients are educated mm. and, uh, and well informed with regard to coming daily for the injections mm. and uh, uh, taking the tablets. Because PAS and INH were not easy to take. Mm. They had to take 20 tablets a day. Yeah? So that, uh, and early on, very often patients will fail. And that would, that would result in non-compliance, relapses, and even drug resistance. Mm. So we made a study of that. And uh, we found that uh, with chemotherapy, the infectivity comes down very rapidly. Mm. Within two weeks, in fact, the, the posit positivity of the bacilli will come down and become, the patient will become less infectious. So, ambulant therapy was the keystone after that. So our beds were released, mm -hmm. and that's how Patoxin developed, evolved into a general medical hospital when we had we could release all the tuberculosis beds. And uh, so compliance bed bed rest was not, you know, and collapse therapy, surgical collapse therapy and medical collapse like artificial pneumothorax or mm -hmm. artificial pneumoperitoneum all became obsolete. We didn't require all these collapse measures. Because in the old days, of course, when we did not have drugs, mm -hmm. we, we depended highly on those. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, so that was one of the things we found the importance of chemotherapy and compliance. So, when with the advent of rifampicin, another very potent drug besides isoniazide, INH, mm -hmm. we found that we could reduce the duration. Mm. Not only that, before that we had inter we did studies on intermittent chemotherapy where 
จนตรงไอเซียนไอเดชวนสิเกิดวันยิ่งวันตัวไอสูริกแต่ก็จะมีควาย longer duration but uh, we refined this in we found that gradually we could reduce the duration to six months in fact we even did studies to four months but I think it's safer and be more cautious that it remains at six months mm. so from 1975 we did several studies on six months regimens the mainstay was streptomycin pyrazinamide isoniazide and rifampicin these were the drugs pyrazinamide was of course a second line drug because it was, it was used for multiple for drug resistance but uh, uh, and it's of course, it's of course more, more toxic. But, uh, but now, we refer to it as an as a mainstay. Uh, we find that the results were excellent. The only thing is, for patient compliance, we have to do it under full supervision. In, in other words, uh, in other words, uh, the patients have to be seen to take the tablets. So that is what at present is known as DOTS, direct observe, directly observe treatment. We call it in our days uh, fully supervised chemotherapy. So that was a very important breakthrough. One of the important benefits was economic savings from two years of drug therapy to six months that was a huge economic savings patient compliance of course shorter duration and uh, so these were the mainstays of our strategy in those days i think the treatment was acceptable not only amongst our collaborating centers, but all worldwide. And in fact, as we used for the last two decades, I think, it still remains the mainstay of tuberculosis treatment. Uh, yes, well, it started really through Dr. Yeo Xiang An. In fact, he was the first chairman of our tuberculosis research committee our Singapore Tuberculosis Research Committee. Mm. We started that in the early 60s when we found, when we collaborated or we studied with Professor John Crofton's mm. strategy. Uh, it was, the committee was based mainly in Tan Tock Seng Hospital. But when we collaborated with British Medical Research Council mm. with Dr. Wallace Fox, we upgraded the committee to a Ministry of Health Tuberculosis Research Committee, where we involve not only uh, our hospital, but also other hospitals and centers that were treating tuberculosis. For example, the outpatient clinics, where we, had, we sent patients all over mm -hmm. Singapore for their supervised treatment. So it became a Ministry of Health Research Committee. Uh, the chairman, was the Deputy Director of Medical Services. Mm. Dr. Yeo, followed by Dr. Supermania. And then in the 80s, I took over for 10 years as chairman. One of the benefits that we had with the British Medical Council was of course our treatment was published in learned journals, it was published in the uh, American Review of uh, Respiratory Diseases, the Lancet, the International Union Against Tuberculosis Journals, and even our acad annals of our Academy of Medicine here. Uh, they were not only published, I think we had at least about 20 accepted publications worldwide. So our 
treatment regimen was only not accept, not only accepted accepted here, mm. but it's now worldwide. It's uh, it's used globally, in fact, because the problem of TB in the third world world countries are still mm. high. Uh, although we have advanced, but our neighboring countries still have a prevalence. So that is why we are a little worried especially with regard to migrant workers because they have come from incidents of high of uh, high rates of tuberculosis, higher rates of tuberculosis. They are still not well developed. So we have to remain vigilant when we have migrant workers. They have to be pre-screened, they have to be checked. Even so, I think some still get through the net and that may explain why our rates of tuberculosis is still there. It has not come down to, to zero levels, which we want to, but we, I think we have to remain vigilant. That is one of the challenges for the future. Mm. We presented, uh, we published those studies, not only in these learned journals, but we had, uh, we, uh, we presented at numerous conferences. Mm. Uh, international conferences and regional conferences. A very important uh, international conference which we held was in 1986 when I was president of that conference. It was a, a global uh, conference on tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we presented several papers at that conference. Dr. Kyo Senki, who was my secretary at that time of the medical, uh, our medical research committee, updated at the conference, mm. and also later at our regional conference in 1996, when again I was asked to decide over that conference. Uh, I must say that uh, it has been very satisfying, but sadly, our collaboration with. Uh, Professor Wallace Fox, and with my retirement, the collaboration ended in the uh, uh, late 80s and uh, 1990. Uh, although we still correspond with some friends there, but the full scale uh, collaboration ended. This was not, not because we wanted to end, but it was mainly because of the policies in UK where they found that they, it was not economical for them to carry on with the tuberculosis work. But uh, I think uh, WHO still has some collaboration with our present uh, staff. Uh, so that is... Uh, uh, one of the, uh, I think it's because tuberculosis, treatment of tuberculosis doesn't generate it, uh, economic returns. I think that's why even with the de vast developments in clinical research, I think not much money has been put in. And the WHO has found this difficult also. It's a way it's sad because the problems of tuberculosis in, for example, in Africa is still very high. And I think in India is still sizable. Well, I'm very glad that uh, our battle is still headed by good people. Professor Sunny Wang, Dr. Cynthia Chi and their team is doing good work. Their challenges are quite great. For example, there is multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. I think that's one of the challenges that they will be working on or they are working on. Mm. Then of course this is compounded by AIDS. The discovery, you know, the our first AIDS patient was in about 19, in the mid 80s. And from them we have had uh, quite a good number of AIDS mm. and a number of them are down with tuberculosis and they very often they are non-compliant you know? so that's one problem uh, so I think these are challenges that uh, Professor Wang and 
Chief will have to <laughs> face. Uh, but I'm sure they the yeah, the team will find uh, some breakthroughs. Uh. My hope, of course, is they find another potent drug. Because since rifampicin and isoniazide, there have been no real breakthroughs, you know. Mm -hmm. And rifampicin was found in, was it, we started work on rifampicin in 1975. So up to now, there has been real no breakthroughs. I hope there will be some breakthroughs. I can't, I can't imagine, you know, with all the immense developments we have in research, why can't one, just one or two drugs, and that would be really sufficient to, to control mm -hmm. the tuberculosis, especially against drug resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is really my prayer and hope. Well, I think coming to the other infectious diseases, for example, during the war and just after, mm. uh, we had smallpox. Mm. Of course, smallpox is eradicated now, mm. but and we had we had good control of smallpox because vaccination was almost compulsory in those days. Mm. But we had a scare. Just before proceeding for my postgraduate training in 1959, sure. we had an outbreak of a, not an outbreak, well, a small outbreak. Somehow, a, an index case from India got through our net and infected some patients. And, uh, and of course, Middleton Hospital was then the center. Mm -hmm. we were, they were, they were quickly rounded up, quarantined, and uh, and since then there were no cases in Singapore of smallpox. That was a uh, that was I think a great achievement. Mm -hmm. The other uh, disease that we had was diphtheria. Mm -hmm. Diphtheria when when I was doing my training. Uh, diphtheria was still uh, quite a, a problem, but uh, our doctors who were attached to Milton Hospital at that time, they became quite experts in tracheostomy because very often patients had blockage of the trachea. Mm. But, uh, and that was life saving. Even the dresses or house. Uh, hospital assistants were quite adept at doing at teaching our doctors in doing tracheostomy, so they were quite adept. But very, uh, our control was very good. Our preven prevention pro program was very good. When we had the triple vaccination, which became com mandatory again, and the incidence of diphtheria came down quite drastically. So diphtheria is not a problem now. Mm. We don't see it. It's a pity because uh, it's good, you know, historically for our doctors to know that there were diseases like that. Mm. The other disease that comes to mind is poliomyelitis. Mm. Poliomyelitis was uh, was a killer, yeah. and it affected children as well as adults. Mm. And uh, we had no cure at the time. Uh, then of course, the only life-saving uh, equipment we had was at the iron lung. Actually, it was displayed in this museum, but it's such a big uh, equipment, it is now in the storage. <laughs> well, it, uh, the iron lung was like a like our artificial respirator. Mm. And of course now, of course, we have intensive care units with respirators, we don't require the iron lung. Mm. So, but thanks to the work of Professor Lim Kok An and our bacteriology department, we uh, had trials on Sabin, oral Sabin vaccination mm. vaccine, mm. which was taken orally. And through that good work, uh, 
of course, poliomyelitis is not a problem. All our children, all, in, even the newborns in KK had oral CBD. So the problem of poliomyelitis uh, gradually came down. So polio again was not a problem. The other disease, of course, which is still a problem globally, is malaria. Uh, immediately after the war, I remember, we used DDT. Of course, we don't use DDT for control of mosquitoes. But uh, we had, malaria was a problem to us. When I did my housemanship, not only Vivex, but falciparum was a deadly disease. And I, and I, when I was doing my housemanship with uh, Professor Gordon Ransom, I had to administer IV quinine when I was a houseman under Professor Gordon Ransom for Maripan patients. And I, met, I administered IV quinine with much trepidation because it's not a drug to be trifled with. Uh, and of course, after the uh, acute phase, we could use quinine orally. And that was a life-saving drug in those days. Uh, our control of uh, malaria has been progressing very well. Um, we have been fairly malaria-free for many, many, many years. Uh, I'm told, especially by Dr. Goki Tai, that uh, malaria are now, the very few patients we have are imported cases, uh, but we have to be very vigilant. Uh, vigilance, of course, is our key point. We must remain vigilant for all these diseases. Uh, the other challenges that we have, uh, well, actually during when I was in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Buki Tai was a very helpful person. Uh, this was with regard to hepatitis B and related conditions. Uh, we studied hepatitis B vaccination, especially for children, because in the 80s, the hepatitis B incidence was very high. And we found that we could even, with the workshop and dome vaccine at that time, we could use half the in that uh, half the recommended dosage, and this continued, and it did very well. Uh, of course, hepatitis B and related conditions remain a challenge, uh, and uh, but one of the dreadful years we ha uh, months we had was SARS. Uh, that was in. 2003, I think, yes. And that was a real heartbreaking time. But it brought the best out of our doctors, our nurses, and our healthcare workers. Uh, they, it was a real sacrifice. Uh, Tan Tok Seng was the main battleground. Uh, we had some casualties, some fatalities, but uh, my hope that is that SARS came for about three months and went off. I hope it will never, never come back. But we have to remain vigilant for such diseases. I think that is a key word. Well, we have MERS coming. I think early this year we had another scare, but fortunately we did not have any cases. Mm -hmm. Korea and I think China also had, but uh, our, vi our vigilance was very and thus I remain very confident with regard to our ID physicians uh, headed by Professor Leo and uh, JJ uh, Chin and the group. I think they, they will uh, remain strong in this battle, I think, as with Professor Sunny Wang and, and his team. Uh, well, uh, well, I've, although I'm still doing national service with regard to healthcare, especially on postgraduate education and uh, uh, and being an emeritus consultant here in this hospital, I've 
stop active practice, although I still keep up, but uh, I'm sure my, my, the younger generation of uh, specialists will, I'm sure, do us proud. I'm confident that they will uh, carry on battling these diseases and they will be very vigilant. I'm fairly confident that we have done well for SG50 and I'm sure we'll go forth to SG100 in confidence. Experience. Just one line, yeah. you know, our it's a pity that our Rotary Clinic has been pulled down, but it was not only the battleground for tuberculosis, but it was also the birthplace mm. of our geriatric medicine in the 80s and also rheumatology and immunology. Sure. It started from there. And